Right. Um, my name is Stefano. I'm um, a fellow at AMD and um, uh, one of the Xen maintainers. And here with me, I have Sentil, uh, who is the safety manager also at AMD uh, for the project we'll discuss today in this presentation. So let me start with a brief intro on what um, um, safety is. Um, second. Um, so safety is, um, is important any time uh, software is running in an environment where a malfunction of the software can cause harm to people. So safety is a series of uh, functional safety is a series of practices, good engineering practices to make sure the software is good quality enough, high quality enough to be runnable in these environments where failure is not an option, or at least failure will have serious consequences. Um, so, uh, yeah, so safety is really about doing the right, uh, uh, doing right, uh, using the right practices to write good software uh, to minimize uh, the risk of failures. Um, um, and so there are, we'll discuss uh, two things, right? In the, the safety standards cover a length development practices to write software from scratch that is safe. Um, and they, in particular, they encourage what has been referred to many times as the B model. Uh, but uh, there, is, there are also ways to qualify as safe pre-existing software, and by pre-existing software, we mean software that has been written following different coding practices. So uh, here is the famous V model um, uh, that is being used to, you know, encouraged uh, to write new uh, software, which is safe. Uh, but I mean, it's not the only way. Um, there are other ways, and this is what we're going to really focus on today uh, to demonstrate that uh, and to prove uh, and to make sure that your software that has not been developed using the V model is still safe. Okay. Now, uh, what we're going to talk about is Zen. So this, this is an example of today uh, as an open source project. We're going to use it as a reference. But many of the lessons learned here and many of the things I'm going to talk about today, you can draw parallels with other open source projects. And maybe you can learn from our, our experience here and what we're going to discuss today and apply to your open source project. Right? It's by no means uh, is limited to, to Zen. So Xen is, uh, no, please go back on. Um, Xen is a uh, um, reference open source hypervisor at AMD, both uh, AMD x86 and ARM. Um, so we have a team to develop, enhance, uh, and support uh, Xen. And we also, Xen is also supported by our premium technical support. One thing that I want to highlight that is interesting, and in this brief intro about Xen, I'm going to highlight here and there a few details that are important in this open source project because they are relevant to safety. And you might think whether your own open source project you care about has uh, similarities or similar features or characteristics that make it easier to safety cert uh, make it safety certifiable. And one of them is uh, real-time uh, isolation. So many of our customers use Zen to separate, and if you watch Philip talk just before mine, to separate Zephyr, like a real-time operating system, from Linux, a non-real-time or a larger, uh, what is called QM uh, uh, operating system. So, um, so hard real-time, um, uh, ensuring that that real-time OS is free from interference, so no matter what the Linux environment does, the, the Zephyr environment is not affected. Uh, this is a very important quality. Uh, usually the safety people call it freedom from, from interference. And this is something that uh, many of our customers already use today in production. Next slide. Um, now, keeping on the uh, theme of highlighting things of the Xen project that are interesting for safety. So Xen has a very diverse uh, community. Uh, and I know the um, fonts are small in the pie chart, but the point is each of those uh, different colors are different contributors. Uh, the, the community is very diverse. And the diversity of the community reflects into the diversity of the maintainers. Now, why is this important? It's important because as we, we all work in the industry and we know how it is, you are close to the deadline and you need to meet, to, to meet the, the, the deadline, otherwise your bonus and your team's bonus is a risk, that feature needs to go in. It's really hard to you know, push back and say you need quality in those, in those times. And often, unfortunately, what happens is 
a code that is suboptimal, suboptimal get committed into the project, which can be a risk for safety. Now, in Zen, is, or I'm not going to say impossible because you know, never say never, but that is very hard to make it happen. And that's because maintainers come from a very, very different background for all different companies, from just to name some, Amazon, Arm, Citrix, AMD, and Suzy, some of the top maintainers. So uh, it's very hard to influence the key maintainers to take bad quality code because they, everyone has different interests. So this is often referred to as independent panel of experts, independent from your company interests. And this is something that is also important for safety. And, and again, I'm, I'm giving you an intro exam, but really taking the opportunity to highlight what is important in an open source project for safety. Now, this is, a, this is an old slide that shows uh, some of the users of Zen, and the bottom right is embedded, top right and top left is data center and cloud. What's interesting is bottom left. Uh, bottom left is uh, security companies and groups that are using Zen as a foundation for their security product. So Zen has been used, for instance, by CubeOS to provide highly secure environments on your laptops to separate sensitive information you know, the kind of, you know, journalists and whistleblowers need to keep safe from uh, your regular, you know, environment where you Google your latest news. Um, that's also important. Uh, good security practices is, good, is also important for safety. Next. Okay. So, uh, as a summary, so Xen has a very strong, a very strong quality uh, process in place in terms of code review from an independent panel of experts. Uh, sometimes it's been, we have been told several times too strict uh, from new contributors. You know, the flip side is then we really spot as many uh, errors as possible. Uh, we also have a very strong security process, incredibly detailed, has been used for years, and many other open source projects used our security process as a base, um, as inspiration. Uh, also, security and isolation are both key um, features of the project. Traceability, everything has been done in public for like 20 plus years on the mailing list, all discussions, all the data is there, there is no yeah, he told me that it was okay, so I committed it. Those kind of things never happen in our project. Uh, every commit is also tested and validated, not on one or on two uh, CI loops. Uh, and there is wide usage of Zen across various verticals, but what I'm going to highlight quickly is all of these verticals have different in requirements, but some of them are interesting to safety in different ways, like Zen in the data center, there's multi-tenancy, so you really need to make sure one VM cannot steal the data on another VM. This is also important for safety. Uh, desktop, QoS, security, you might want to make sure you, through a virus in your Windows environment, you don't get, you know, the sensitive data doesn't get out. And embedded, we talked about the real-time isolation. Okay, so uh, uh, AMD is uh, working on making Zen safety certifiable for AMD platforms, both AMD x86 and ARM. Uh, we are targeting IE661508, CL3, and we are also targeting ISO 26262, ASOD. Uh, this certification is, I mean, the safety certifiability is based on the upstream project. So, uh, meaning that we are not, you know, taking a fork and doing a lot of work behind the scene and then taking the snapshot, safety certifying it, and you know, no. We are actually basing the safety certifiability on the upstream work by the community and the upstream releases. And that's gonna also make it a lot easier, is first of all, to give back to the community and upstreaming many of these things, aligning the community with their efforts, but also it's gonna make it a lot easier for us to update in the future the safety certifiability of the project uh, when there is a future uh, release or a future update. Um, no, now, uh, many of, uh, I, I'm, I'm not going to promise that everything is going to be fully open source, but ma most of the things that we are, good, we are doing as part of this effort are going to be. So we are going to uh, make uh, the code base MISO C compliant, and we are going to upstream that. We are going to uh, improve the documentation, and we are going to upstream that. And uh, we are going to improve the testing. So there's going to be a significant impact and positive impact to the community um, uh, thanks to this effort. Absolutely. Oh, yeah, Steve. Uh, 
Stefano, uh, he talked about uh, certifying uh, pre-existing software. Uh, so uh, I'm going to discuss about uh, what are the pathways we are taking uh, to certify as an as open source hypervisor. So we, so as we as we as he mentioned that uh, the target is IEC 61508 and uh, ISO 26262 uh, for ASLD and that's for NASIL 3. That's a systematic capability 3. And uh, what we are doing is we are segregating the core components of Zen hypervisor, uh, which is uh, which is for the. Uh, uh, isolating uh, a safe and a non-safe workload, and we have identified the core components for both x86 and ARM, and we are certifying it. Uh, uh, we are uh, we we are certifying it for uh, x86 and ARM uh, 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 for the target standards. It's not specific to particular board, but it's a kind of uh, hardware. Uh, board in specific uh, certification it will be. Yeah. So this is this is a pathway. I think he mentioned about uh, the quality process. Zen is already in a very in a good following good uh, software development quality and the security practices. And uh, as uh, the safety standards like IEC 61508 and uh, 26262, they allow uh, to qualify a pre-existing uh, software. And that's what we call a tailored software safety life cycle. So we take this, uh, I mean, we are, these are all the pillars, right? Established open source development process, which is available for Zen, And we have a very strong security practices. And, and, and we identify what are the minor gaps uh, in the context of uh, the safety standards. And we fill those gaps. And, and some organizational supporting process, which I can discuss a little bit later. And with all these, we go for some independent functional safety assessment by third party, and we prepare in a safety case, and that would be suitable for claim uh, to uh, ACLD for ISO 26262 and uh, SIL 3 or systematic capability 3 for IEC 61508. So for the people that are not familiar, these are the highest corresponding for the strictest in both ISO and as well as the IEC. Yeah. Yeah. Can you see? So the assessment, I think uh, we are in alignment with the different uh, safety certification authorities. The assessment can happen uh, in a two phases. The so first phase is a uh, concept approval where we present uh, our organizational process and the safety management and uh, the overall the safety concept. Uh, the target use case of that is in hypervisor where it can be used to isolate the safety workload and the non-safety workload. That safety concept and architecture will be assessed by the third party company. And uh, that's one phase. And the second phase will be the detailed test, means that uh, whatever we presented in the first phase, that will be assessed, uh, all the verification and the traceability and everything will be assessed in the second phase. And uh, we, will, we will complete we hope to kind of uh, uh, finish that um, uh, in the two phases in a typical uh, safety certification project of the software. So this is a, it's a kind of an alignment uh, we have with uh, uh, different uh, uh, third party authorities. So the concept approval, it's a safety concept as I mentioned that is an architecture and how it's uh, the target uh, 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 in the target system, like industrial or automotive, how that uh, hypervisor is going to be used to isolate the safety from non-safety. That's a concept review. And then second is that functional safety management, whether that people and that organization who is performing these activities is uh, uh, have enough capability in a functional safety management and uh, related safety-related activities. That part will be assessed by a third-party assessor. And uh, these are... Uh, uh, the activities and the plans associated with each phase, like a concept review. We have uh, safety requirements in the morning sessions. I think there was a lot of talk about uh, the requirements, uh, the quality of the requirements, and uh, and we have the architecture and we have a verification plan on validation plan, and uh, and the tools are used in that development life cycle of the pre-existing software will be classified and. Uh, uh, qualified 
based on the classification criteria. And then we have all the functional safety management related work products like assessment plan, safety plan, and how we are compliant with uh, configuration management and change management, how the document control works. So these kind of things are coming under the uh, safety management activities. So in the concept approval phase, uh, we expect uh, these two uh, categories and uh, these are all the possible work products that can be submitted to the auditor and uh, uh, get a uh, concept approval. So once you finish your concept, safety concept approval, uh, that shows that you have enough capability and your safety concept is uh, uh, was reviewed and approved by the auditor. And then you move to the second phase where you provide more verification activities uh, like a safety analysis, uh, uh, software FMEA, software failure mode analysis can be performed, uh, and the tools qualification. Uh, so for example, you have an, a compiler used in your safety development lifecycle, whether it's a GCC compiler, we need to make sure that GCC compiler or any, it's not introducing any new faults in the software, so we need to make sure uh, the compiler is classified and uh, uh, accordingly, and uh, if there is any fault in the particular version of the compiler, we need to put some mitigations at a uh, software level. And then coding is uh, the thing that uh, the safety standards recommend a strong uh, uh, good coding practices. The MISRA C is, uh, uh, is a very good coding practice used in more automotive and industrial segment industries. So uh, following MISRA C and complying to MISRA C's mandatory and required guidelines, uh, will make the code very bulletproof for any safety certification activities. So, and the verification, specification, validation, specification. Uh, the gen is already doing a lot of tests. So I'm not saying that we are not doing any tests now. We are already doing, say, a lot of tests. But what we are trying to do is here is that perform some additional tests so that you can fill all the gaps uh, from the context of the safety standards like IEC 61508 and ISO 26262, so that that can be reviewed, audited, and certified by the third party authority. So that gives more bulletproof. And you provide a user guide and a safety manual. Safety manual is the one that's very important once uh, we certify our uh, any software for any or hardware for the safety certification that has to be accompanied by a safety manual that explains how that particular hardware element or software element should be used in the target system. So the customer or the user who is going to use a certified hardware or software element in this context is in, so they need to follow the safety manual where uh, we provide a lot of assumption of use cases and what are the restrictions and uh, what are the configurations you need to use in order to use in a safety critical context. And that safety case is the uh, one that uh, which the safety manager prepares uh, for the auditor to claim that particular piece of software is uh, uh, SIL3 or ACLD for whatever target we are deciding for the intended safety critical use cases. So if I can list out the table, all the required activities, you see that work products and evidence, safety requirements, we need to have a very clear requirements, which is verifiable requirement, and architectural specification, uh, which maps that requirement, and then implementation part, and then the verification. Uh, you have to cover the uh, performance test, the regression test, uh, uh, additionally in software, safety, uh, have a fault injection test, simulate some faults uh, to see how the system responds. So that kind of test we can can be added. Uh, it's all good quality. I mean, rather than safety, it increases the reliability of the software and the quality of the software. Uh, so that, that that's the whole argument of uh, safety uh, in an industrial and automotive context. Then perform the tool analysis, uh, which we list out the tools and classify according to the safety standard and uh, and make sure that mitigations are in place. And software failure analysis is a, is an approach that uh, you list out possible failure modes and what are the effects that can have those failures in that system 
then mitigations, the possible mitigations. The process control, which we we'll talk about, or the safety management related activities like uh, document control, change control process, uh, and the uh, safety plan, uh, the training training for the people who are involved in the safety related activities, uh, and the safety manual and the safety case. So approximately these kind of uh, work products and evidence uh, will convince the auditor to certify a particular piece of software for uh, a target uh, safety integrity level. Uh, yeah, so this one is uh, so uh, the pre-existing software. So the question is, I mean, if you ask whether a, a software which is already developed, which is already in use, uh, can it be safety certified? The answer is yes, provided the software has followed good software development practices and good testing. If it is already in place, then we can find out uh, the minimal gaps by performing gap analysis and then fulfilling those gaps. Uh, a software safety can be achieved for an uh, open source or any pre-existing software. I mean, approximately I can say that based on my experience, if you have uh, 50,000 lines of code, which is pre-existing software, or already developed software with a good quality process in place, um, with some uh, 60 percentage of testing and 30 percentage of documentation efforts that can be safety certified by a third party uh, authority. I mean, approximate, so again, 50,000 50, lines of code and uh, within 24 to 30 months of approximate time period. So depending on how many test cases you already have uh, in place and etc. So anyway, that I mean, if you're taking any open source code and uh, adding more tests, so that increases the overall quality and reliability of the software. That's good for the software overall. That's good for the project. So irrespective of the safety, if you add more tests, that improves the quality and the reliability. So in either way, that uh, that's good for the project. Okay, this is uh, yeah, expected deliverables. Deliverables when you go for a third party audit, like a concept report I mentioned about the audit can happen in two phases. The first phase, you finish uh, uh, safety concept review audit, then you get in a concept report. Uh, then once you complete your, all your uh, two phases, final assessment will provide you uh, safety certificate and a report and a technical reports uh, that can be that can be packaged to any interesting customers uh, of of anyone who's performing that thing. Next one. Uh, periodic audits, yeah. So once that is certified, I think uh, there is a uh, regulatory requirement. Uh, there is a requirement uh, from the standard that uh, that has to be periodically audited to make sure that. Uh, a third party assessor certify a software, they need to make sure that we already, we will be still having that process in place once in a 12 to 18 months gap period that uh, there will be a periodic audit. And if there's any new feature is added, and that feature we need to make an impact analysis, yeah, add a new feature makes any significant impact on the overall safety or not, then based on that, the recertification of the new feature is decided. Okay. So I give it to Stefano. So um, thank you, Sentio. So what I'm trying to now answer is um, what is really the alignment needed between an, your open source project uh, in this example, Zen, but it really, I think this lesson learned applied to many others. Uh, what is the alignment needed uh, between your open source project and safety, safety requirements, safety, people working in safety? Um, or to, say, to rephrase the same question, what can the open source project do for safety and what can the safety do for the open source project, right? So let, let, let me start by saying that in the example of Xen, uh, by making Xen safety certifiable as part, uh, you know, a, a customer could take Xen as part of their software stack and use it in an environment that it was not possible to use it before. Like anywhere where human lives are at risk, the automotive, certain industrial environments and, and more. Right, so you're going to get a lot more users. Users mean more development, more development developers, and more developers mean a richer, better, more healthy, uh, healthier community. So, 
Uh, that certainly is better for the project, but there are actually more concrete uh, benefit to the open source project that I want to highlight. And one of them uh, you know, is coding guidelines, the other one is documentation, and the third one is testing. And next slide. And so let me start by talking about the coding guidelines. So in order for your software to be high quality enough, uh, it only makes sense that it has very strict and, you know, and good coding guidelines. Um, and uh, Misra C is one, or maybe the best, of the safe coding guidelines out there uh, for the C language. Uh, and it really allows you to write safe uh, C code, avoiding many of the common mistakes, and really makes your programming better. And in security, you will call this defensive programming, maybe. But here we just, uh, we call it Misra C and trying to avoid uh, common mistakes, undefined behavior, and things like that. So one of the things that I want to highlight for Misra C, but is really true for all of these things, is I have the impression that in the open source community, and I am an open source guy first, right? Uh, so I definitely, I mean, I, I, um, myself included, uh, there is a kind of impression the safety is more about bureaucracy and paperwork than anything else. And I want to stress that this is not true, right? So safety is really about safety. It's really about making your code safer, uh, making every feature that you use tested, and the, any interfaces that you have well-documented, which are normal same principle that, you know, normal good coding practices. And this is really important good to get your, your, your community on board, I mean, to understand this, and also on board with making these changes. It's also okay, I mean, not all open source community and open source projects are necessarily meant for this. You know, because writing good software takes longer than writing bad software. Write, I mean, this is a bit of an extreme example, but let, let me make a better example. Writing a lot of tests take more time than writing zero tests, right? So uh, it would be a reasonable choice to write faster software with far, far less testing. And this can be a good choice for some communities. But if your community is a community that cares about quality of the code, as um, security-sensitive deployments, safety-sensitive deployments, really care about isolation, freedom for interference, like the Xen community does, then it makes sense. There is alignment, right? There is really already, is, maybe we are talking different languages for sure. Like sometimes there's a lot about choosing the word that you use when you speak about people that have a security background instead of a safety background. But the values are really the same, right? You can, there's a lot of common ground to, to be had. So the first step, to, in my opinion, is really to find this common ground and align your community behind your efforts to improve the quality of the code base with things like Misra C and documentation and testing. And in the specific case of Misra C, it's really not enough to say, we are going to do Misra C, right? That's not practical. It's not even actionable. So what you need to do is one by one with your community, evaluate the Misra C guidelines, find out with the one that makes sense for your project, adopt them in your own guidelines for your project, and make sure they are uh, respected um, by both contributors, maintainers, uh, of, or, um, uh, as, submit, as they keep submitting new patches. Um, uh, so, uh, um, yes, so in the Xen community, uh, we have been following this process uh, for a while. Let me stay here for a second. So uh, in the Xen community, we have been following this process for a while, and we are in the process of adopting Misra C rules. We have already adopted, actually that number is a bit uh, um, old, I think about 45 out of uh, 100 something rules, and we're going through them one by one, and the more we go through them, the more that we find alignment. Because the people realize that these are actually, if not always good rules, for certain they always highlight real problems, right? And maybe the suggested solution is not always the best one, but there is really value in talking about every one of these things. Um, we are also uh, adding, so 
when you have a, a rule, sometimes you don't want to follow it 100% of the time. Uh, so you know, in some cases, you might want to have a deviation, that you are, you, are sure, you are sure that the code is safe, even so technically it's violating the rule. So we have a framework to do, via, to do deviations by in-code comments, which uh, these tags uh, are tagging the deviations, and um, we uh, can link them with uh, the explanation for the deviation. And we can also have generic tagging that work with multiple tools. Now, tools. Next slide. This brings me to one of the most important benefits of using miseracy, and that is about using static analysis. So there is a lot of focus nowadays about uh, you know, safe coding, safe languages. So for what uh, regard C is the best tool we have in our toolbox by far is static analysis. There are very, very smart, powerful, capable static analyzers that can scan your patches, scan your code base, and find any problem with it, Misra C or not Misra C even. Like, they can detect um, uh, any sort of issues, including uh, I was going to go with the classic example or missing free of buffers, but you know, in Zen it's not that we are located that much memory, so it's not a good example, but any kind of, any kind of uh, bad software and, and, and bugs. So one of the key things that we are doing is integrating the static analysis tools as part of our GitLab CI uh, process. This way we can automatically scan any new patch from any contributor uh, for um, um, problems, for violations. Now, this is, I cannot stress this enough, this is a fantastic, amazing benefit to the community. So instead of having the maintainer by hand, you know, review and say, ah, this basic thing, you did it wrong, this other silly thing, you did it wrong, all of this basic stuff is going to be done automatically for you. Thinks of all the benefit for the contributor. Instead of having to argue with a human, it has to argue with a computer. And we are all in software because we don't like to talk to people, right? We like to talk to computer most. And now you get to talk to computer all the time. So, so this is, is a great benefit all around. Um, Documentation and testing, I mean, starting from docs, I mean, we all know the, the old joke is uh, that the, the open source software are te terrible at documentation. That's the old cliche. Um, I think it's not true anymore. We are actually doing decently well at documentation, not just Zen, but other projects as well. That said, the documentation in, uh, required by safety, the level of correctness is, you know, 100%. is higher than uh, most project offer. So, um, and one thing I can recommend is to uh, use Doxygen and RST to keep the documentation close to the code. It makes it easier to keep in sync so that you can have maintainers uh, make sure that the documentation is updated together with the interface. And we are already doing it in Zen. Although not everything is the docs in RST yet, we need some rework, but definitely we have been keeping documentation up to date with the code for a while now. And the last thing I want to talk about is testing. Uh, and again, the other cliche is in open source, many projects are not quite well tested, right? That cliche is not true anymore either, right? We have a lot of testing. We have GitLab CI and other infrastructure. And in Zen project alone, we have two CI loops. And one of them is GitLab CI. And has been grown a lot in the last few years. So we now have 118 GitLab tests as of last week. Among them, uh, many are runtime tests. And some of them even on real hardware. I'm saying this because usually GitLab CI is a way of testing a hypervisor or something low level is to spin out QEMU and run in emulation inside the, core, the kernel or hypervisor. We even have real hardware tests based on GitLab runner contributed from the community. So people like us at Xilinx are contributing a GitLab runner. They're running tests on our favorite hardware of choice so we can make sure that Xen does not break on a specific target. There are other in the community that are also contributed GitLab runners, like Cubes is contributing a GitLab runner to make sure Suspend Resume does not break on certain classes of laptops they care about. Um, so one thing that you know it would be good to have going forward is to make sure that every new feature get tested otherwise does not get introduced. And if that makes sense, otherwise you know it can break at any time. And I want to conclude this presentation uh, basically uh, with this message. So your open source project, as long as has been developed with good, sane coding practices, processes, and uh, strong reviews, can probably be made safety certifiable, right? And um, to, to get there, I think the key is, first of all, to align the community behind it. You cannot really force the community to do safety. You need to convince them and, and, and that is the right thing for the project. And it might not be the right thing for every project because writing documentation and writing tests doesn't have a zero cost, right? 
Um, and it's fair to take that into account. Um, and the other thing to want to highlight is safety is not about the paperwork. And I mean, as you saw from the details, all the details from Sentinel, there is certainly some certain documentation to be provided. But if your project is really good at the quality of documentation, the quality of the code base, and the quality of testing, I can promise you that the paperwork is not the issue. Right? So as an open source project and an open source community, absolutely focus on that. Right? Um, yeah, I think this is the end of the presentation. Uh, and if you have any questions, uh, I, I'm opening the floor for anything you might want to ask. So I guess you make a very good point with get the community buy-in, because otherwise, well, you can just simply, th it doesn't work in a community, it doesn't work in a normal company if you just say follow the rules especially if you have no control about the people. It has to be a win-win, right? It has exactly. to be a win for the community because they improve the code, they improve the testing, improve the quality of the release, improve the documentation that is great for new contributors, is even better for the maintainer when they need to maintain the interfaces. And this, of course, is good for the people that care about safety. Of course, if the community doesn't want to increase quality, which is, a, you have to be honest, is a, is a decent choice, right? It's always a compromise. So then it doesn't work. And um, for this part, if you follow Ms. Rossi guides and you have community, maybe uh, how do you treat it? Because maybe not everybody in the community has access to the Ms. Rossi. So guidelines. that's a very good question. Um, so Ms. Rossi, uh, for the, so, so the one of you that don't know, Ms. Rossi uh, is not open. So uh, the coding guidelines, uh, the document, it, it costs, uh, but the cost is very moderate. Uh, I'm not going to name any numbers because I don't remember, but it's, a, it's, res it's reasonably affordable. So what we did is the following. We um, exam, uh, exam project as a small budget, as an open source project, and we use that budget to buy a Misra C copy for every one of the key maintainers and contributors. In addition, uh, you, know, you don't need to have the full Misra C copy in order to uh, read the result of a scan and say you have a violation here uh, and, and think that's good enough for the uh, pass by contributions of people that are not regular and submit a patch, they spot something, uh, they're usually just highlighting there is something there is good enough. Um. Uh, thank you. It was a really good talk. Um, <clears throat> so I'm in aerospace and uh, we do have hypervisors we use in aerospace. Um, they're closed source. Now I'd say one of the bridges to get Xen into aerospace would be um, we, we need documented service history, like where it's being used. And then when we put it into a high criticality use case, we can actually point to the F, tell the FAA, point to it and say, it's used here and here's the fault history and this is how it's been managed, those kinds of things. So that would, that would be helpful. I know obviously, it's an open source project. Anybody can download it and do it. Um, but that would be like one big thing that's missing from this to be able to point to service history that would make it easier to get it into aerospace applications. So we actually thought about that because it also might not be a strict requirement for ISO or for IEC. Certainly what you just described, service history, it helps. Uh, so my solution to that is um, to reach out. So the thing about open source is anyone can download and deploy. Right, uh, and doesn't need to necessarily to tell you about. So for sure, I'm only analyzing the tip of the iceberg. But the tip of the iceberg is huge for a project like Zen. Like, it's usually way m m bigger than proprietary hypervisor can claim, and I bet it's the same for many other open source projects. So my uh, approach to that is, uh, to go to a Xen Summit a conference, speak with the people that uh, are in these other companies and get usage data from them. And in the case of Zen, it could be Amazon, it could be uh, Rackspace, it could be like any of Xilinx customers or, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But um, the fact that it's open source should not stop you necessarily from gathering the service data. In, if, if nothing, you have more to gather, right? Um, I, in fairness, we have not started this activity, so I'll let you know next year when I give you an update how far we came along uh, with that. Yeah. The, the service history, uh, definitely, it's, uh, it's an added argument in the safety case. Yeah, definitely.
um, I'm, I'm in the uh, space of uh, process safety, right? Uh, we follow the 658 uh, edition 3 of 658 will come out roughly around 2027. It will put additional requirements on the process and especially about the classification of each requirement. Is there a plan to bring Zen to that level? Four years from now? Unless Zen to take this one. Yeah. So, so I think the question is about the, uh, the software safety requirements. Uh, so, uh, when we certify the uh, pre-existing software and the requirements of all those components are considered as uh, safety requirements. So what we perform is for the pre-existing software, based on that already available interfaces, we uh, retrospectively we can uh, backtrack the requirements and we can pull uh, requirements from the implementation interfaces and we can manage those requirements in a systematic way. So in that way, that requirements and the architecture and the implementation are in sync and it can be it can be traceable from our requirements to the implementation. I don't think that will work because we are doing right now, right? We are preparing for edition three in the our documentation process. Each requirement will have to be classified as safety, functional, security, packaging, whatever, right? And one more additional requirement that for the edition three, which will come out four years from now, right? Would be that on the user manual, we need to be linked to product, uh, system requirements, right? So there are a lot more work to be done for that, to be for that. Another question would be that, does Zen have dynamic memory allocation? So I think it's uh, static. Yeah, so that's a good question. Uh, at the moment, there is still dynamic memory allocation. However, uh, I, I, I really plan to remove it entirely. And the reason is, especially on, on even today, at least on, uh, on the ARM side, the amount of memory allocation at runtime is tiny. And even today, without any code changes in the right configuration, you could probably take it completely away. Um, boot memory allocation, yes, right? With the, but after boot, uh, I think even today, it will not be too difficult to get close to zero memory allocation without any changes. And for sure, as part of this project, we are going to look at this closely and ideally take it completely out, not just for ARM, but also on the AMD x86 side. The reason why we can do that is because, uh, you know, something that Sentinel mentioned, but we didn't go into details for time reason. The, the configuration that we are looking to make safety certifiable is what we call them zero-less. And what it means is Xen starts and creates the VMs directly at boot. Um, so, and then it doesn't create any VMs anymore. So all the allocation is done once at boot time and not again. So thanks to this model, this is different from the traditional model. We should know the traditional model is then start a VM, the VM then ask for more VMs to be created. So in this new model, then there is really no need for any new resource allocation after the boot phase. Um, yeah, so we should be able to achieve it. Yeah. yeah, as long as you do not have dynamic memory allocation at one time, you're fine. Sorry if my question is silly, it's not my world. When you, when you talk about safety certification, uh, who decides what the requirements are? Is it, is it uh, the standards? Is it the state regulations? Who writes the rules on what is safe and what is not safe to be certified? So I think there are two sides of this question. One is from Sentinel. I mean, the authority, this is a safety assessor, I have a clear idea what this requirement needs to be. Now, who writes it is, of course, needs to people that are familiar enough with the hypervisor to know all the details, I mean, to know exactly the expected behavior in all cases of the hypervisor. Can, can it be different from one country to another, for instance? Can it be certifiable in states but not, uh, not in Mexico because they have different set of requirements? That's based on my question. Who writes the rules, and, and is it, is it, is it, is it a, a worldwide standard, or is it different? ISO is stand for International Standard Organization, so, right? So you're answering my question. The standards write the rules. The rules are in the standard, right? That's it. Thank you. The rules are in the standard, and uh, 
the external or third party uh, certification authority who are authorized to audit and to certify the products, they make sure that the requirements are in alignment with the standards. Then they certify. So there's a solid proof that uh, we are following the particular standard. But this is valid for, for instance, let's say that one day we were looking at the 0178, uh, which is the avionics one. Uh, it might be slightly different, right? And there might be a slightly word, different wording and expectation. Also, usually they are roughly aligned, all of these st uh, certification standards. Um, but there are differences between them, yeah. Any last question? If you don't mind, I can add sure. to that. Um, it, it's not the standard that matters. It's if you're the OEM and you're trying to create a device, either an airplane or a car or anything, you tell the regulator what standards you plan to comply with. So then the regulator will hold you to that standard. And if it's a good standard, like an ISO standard, then the regulator is not going to give you much trouble. But if it's something really obscure, something that only partially complies, then it's going to make your job a lot more complicated. The OEM will tell the regulator what they're going to comply with, and they will tell the, reg the OEM that's not good enough. You need to do better than that. But it it's a negotiation. Well, thank you, everybody, uh, for the good questions. I hope you enjoyed my talk, and uh, I'll be in the hallway if you have any more questions. Thank you. Thank you.